So my name is Flexika for everyone who <laughs> you might be interested. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the work that I do at the uh, DRL um, lab that is on this floor. Um, and it's about uh, large scale uh, program analysis. It's going to be quite an, uh, like a very brief overview of the things. Um, and it's based on the um, <clears throat> on the word that based on like uh, last four papers that I had in this um, in this field. So the um, languages like you know, programming languages like natural languages they need to evolve. And they need to evolve constantly. If the language doesn't evolve, it will follow the fate of um, Ada, Smalltalk, Pascal. You know languages which were once very very popular but eventually fell out of favor and became uh, neglected and sort of disappeared. Here's an example of a code that you would write in um, <clears throat> Anafield to like 2005 in uh, Java 5.4. It's basically just iterating over uh, some collections and doing some filtering and mapping the values. Now in 2005, um, you, will have to re you will rewrite this code into that because the language evolved and that was basically the single biggest change in the Java evolution was the uh, introduction of generics. So now we have a generic uh, containers that you can specialize for a particular type. We also have this enhanced for loop. Um, so this code eventually becomes as simple as that one. Uh, later in Java 7, we got a diamond operator, which gives us a partial uh, type inference. So now no longer on the initialization side, we need to specify what's going to be the type of the container. And then with uh, <coughs> Java, uh, Java 10, uh, we get uh, a completely different way of writing the thing. It becomes much more functional. We got a stream API, local variable uh, inference, so we no longer need to uh, specify what is the result of uh, or what is the type of the filtered variable, and we get lambdas. All right. And if you would follow uh, languages like uh, C or C sharp, you will see a similar kind of evolution. There are different reasons for the language evolution. One is that the uh, language needs to keep with the uh, friends of current hardware and software development, and that's why we recently see a lot of uh, things coming from the functional uh, programming languages into what is the uh, traditionally interactive object-oriented languages like Java. So we have more functional programming construct because they scale better on the uh, multi-core. And also the languages need to somehow cope with the um, design mistake that they're done in the past. Right, then we come to the language and we get that. Now the hard part of this is, uh, you know, how do you make the, uh, the, the change as little intrusive as possible. Or in other words, how uh, Martin Bushels put it, he has been maintaining JDK for last decade, he says that every change is an incompatible change. And careful risk-benefit analysis is always required. Now, the thing is that it's not just the compiler and the API or the library that need to change the runtime system, but you also need to uh, you know, propagate the change, let the developers know you have to uh, uh, <clears throat> write a new documentation. You know, all the books that have been written, all the stack overflow questions that have been uh, uh, you know, asked and answered for these particular things, they all become less and less uh, relevant with every new version of the language. So there's quite a lot of cost. Uh, before Java moved to this uh, six month release cycle in 2018, <coughs> Oracle estimated that its cost uh, for each and every uh, Java version was about 50 million dollars. So, how do you do this um, assessment? You know, how do you figure out how much of a change or uh, a particular change will require in the ex uh, ecosystem? Well, until recently, the, um, the programming language designers and, and implementers didn't really have many things how to assess the change. They can rely on mailing or maybe some community. The uh, forum I scoped uh, from two, uh, like late 2019, GitHub has 30 million users and 100 million repositories. Today is going to be at least double, right? But over a certain scale, it doesn't really matter. You know, if you have 100 million projects or 200 million projects, you know, it's beyond the thing that we can really look at uh, today anyway. But what is really cool with this is that now we can actually use static dynamic program analysis to actually get insights and empirical evidence for all the changes that we would like to introduce in the, uh, in the language, right? So it's no more a guessing really, but now we can really figure out, you know, what is going to be the impact if you would like to make a particular API change, if you would like to deprecate something, 
You know, we can actually see how many projects will you know, fail to compile, for example. You know, how many things we can uh, possibly uh, mm -hmm. automatically repair in the code and things like that. So this is what uh, is uh, the access to so much of the code allows us to do. And that's basically what I am like trying to do. You know? I'm trying to run large scale program analysis to answer questions related to, uh, to uh, the program evolution. So, so um, I did four, uh, four studies in, in this area. The first one was uh, about uh, testing in, in, in the R language. And particularly the idea was that, well, if developers, then they don't really write a comprehensive test suite in R and you know, R developers are like developers in all the other languages, they don't do tests much, then is there a way that we can synthesize this for them? Okay. Um, the other one was for programming language called Scala. There, uh, there's a particular um, feature in Scala, which is called implicits, which is the probably the most powerful or the most defining feature of Scala, but it's also the most controversial. And in this study, we are trying to answer the question, how is this feature being used in real life projects? And concretely, given the transition from Scala 2 to Scala 3, when they were trying to rework the, uh, the, the way how the implicits were implemented, uh, can we somehow provide some feedback about you know, which project would be incompatible and, and things like that. And I'm going to detail these two papers uh, later, so that's why I'm going to quite quickly go through. Then um, there were more work in, um, in, in R. Um, it's designing types for R that's basically a part of an outgoing process that we would like to gradually type R. So R is a dynamic programming language. It doesn't have any type annotations. So we write code like you know, in Python or JavaScript. And uh, but it would be nice if you could put there some annotations because that would hopefully give us a little bit more guarantee about how the programs behave and we could catch uh, bugs earlier, right? So the thing here was, or the point of this paper was that we would like to get some initial uh, data that can guide us how to build a type system that we can retroactively fit inside R. Uh, what we did there was that we basically tried to design uh, Type system that was you know as simple as possible, and then gradually iterate over it to make it uh, better and better based on the data that we got. So it was 400 uh, packages for that, and it was always that we synthesize all the runnable code from those packages, run it, record the data, try to infer types from it, and then use this as a feedback for the next run and see you know which of the uh, <clears throat> type annotations make sense, which of they don't, and Finally, we manage with quite a, a simple system because there's something we would like the R developers to actually write in the code so they can create this sort of a, a simple annotation saying you know, that this is a, a function which takes uh, a string and returns an, an integer. So it has to be fairly simple. Uh, the, the, the resulting type system is quite nice because uh, it has 80% of monomorphic signatures, meaning that you don't have any union of data types, it's just a, one particular one. And during this uh, type system, we actually managed to eliminate quite a lot of checks which our programmers use in their code, right? So some people really care about types, so they need to do just the manual assertions asking, well, is this parameter a string or an int or something like that? And the final work, uh, the, the, the most recent, which was uh, actually presented like two months ago, uh, is about eval. And it's a goal also in R. So eval is this uh, functionality which basically um, allow you to turn an unstructured text into a code and then run this code. Right? And now the, the, the problem with this is that if you have this facility in your language and you would like to do any static analysis, basically trying to figure out what is happening inside your program with eval, you know, the, the, the static analysis uh, loses so much precision to the point that it becomes useless. There's this. Um, you know, the, the researchers who are doing static analysis, they get together and they publish this so-called the uh, soundiness manifesto. And they start arguing, well, maybe instead of really looking for a sound static analysis, maybe we can just look for something more pragmatic. So let's say we ignore eval, right? Because most of the time it's not going to do something bad, and then we can continue as we want. And that's great, and it's going to work in, 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 in many settings. But unless someone actually looks how the eval is going to use, you know, this would be really unduly optimistic. And that's what we did in this paper. Right? We really analyzed this time we managed to scale to uh, pretty much all the packages which are available in the, uh, in the R ecosystem. 
and we tried to look at how people are using uh, We were actually at the very beginning, we were very ambitious. We thought that we can actually remove a valve, we can replace it with more uh, systematic constructs. But in the end, it turned out that the eval in R is as bad as it can get. Right? And the, the worst thing is that the eval has really an unrestricted, unrestricted access. It can go you know, anywhere in the call stack and modify anything you want. Um, but nevertheless, we did this analysis, analyze all the eval that was used, we classified the, uh, the patterns that are being used, uh, we looked at where are the expressions, the side effects, origins, and things like that. So now we have at least a good understanding how eval is being used for R. So for anyone who would attempt to do any sort of static analysis in R, which is hard by definition, has a little bit more of a side effect. So now with this, uh, let me just zoom into these two uh, to show you a little bit more how such analysis of studies are being done. So let's start with BFS from traces. So um, can you test it degenerate? Imagine that you have a function like this. It's just a simple function, which is a filter. And what it does is that it filters uh, some collection using some predicate. And this is the way how we write it in R. That's not that super interesting. It's just you know, a regular filter on a collection. So you have such a, uh, you develop such a function in your package. You don't have any test for this function, but you have some code which is using it. It might be in the documentation as an example, or there's some other library which is using your code, right? And this is using your test function. So the question is, can we actually take all of this code and turn it into a unit test that you can use later, for example, for regression testing or something like that, right? To kind of give you a unit testing for free. Um, the, the, the reason why I thought it might be uh, useful to do it in R was that um, the R packages themselves, they contain some runnable test, right? So we have something that we can run from which we might be able to synthesize <coughs> unit code. So if you look, this, uh, uh, this is a histogram of all the, uh, the, the runnable uh, lines in, in R packages. You know? So there are quite a lot of uh, packages which has, I don't know, it's a log scale, so it's going to be like a 100 something lines of code. So there is something from it. so it's a, that's a good assumption. And also the packages have reverse dependencies. So this is a histogram of reverse dependencies. So you know, quite a lot of packages are at least some clients. You know? So we can maybe get those ones as well, extract code from them and run it. So here is the approach. What we could do is that we can uh, take an R package, take, look at all the functions which are defined in the package and instrument them in the way that we will record every single invocation or every single call to those functions defined in the package. Right? Once we do that, we, uh, we get all the runnable code that we can get from the package itself and from all the dependent R packages, all the reverse dependencies. So we get a bunch of R code, then we run it inside this environment, then we trace all the calls, and we get uh, something which we call a uh, program trace. Program trace is just a, you know, a function pointer, and then all the uh, argument values, the return value, and some state. And the state is you know, whatever we would like to have. In this case, in R, what makes sense to get is, for example, the random seed uh, state, right? So <clears throat> we can then reproduce the calls. And once we have all this, then we can turn this uh, back to code and you know in the test format and rerun it and see how many of these calls we managed to reproduce. Once we have a reproducible test, that becomes part of the test suite and it will hopefully improve the code coverage of the package, right? Because if you have tests, then you can do easy refactoring and you know all the benefits that our uh, testing gives. So to give you a little bit more detail how it works, so this is still our function. I hope it's a little bit redundant to the back. Um, what we do is that we, uh, uh, we <clears throat> instrument it. So this is the code that we inject inside. There's a lot of noise, but basically what is only interesting is this uh, record trace that's then we uh, call to our environment and asking it to save whatever variety parameters are uh, involved. And here's actually the original code. It's just pretty much you know, copy and paste in here. And now if we have this client code and we run this, uh, we get a trace. So here, the entire function invocation by running this one line is saved. We have all the, 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 the state, we have the return value, and we also need to um, manage to somehow deal with all the global variables. Basically, we need to record everything, store everything, in order to make this call reproducible in complete isolation. Right? So that involves a little bit of machinery to, treat, to go through the environment, find all the dependencies between the functions. But when we have this, then we can uh, uh, 
you can record and hopefully turn the like the recorded traces into traces. So um, <clears throat> once we have a trace, uh, we can turn it into a test case. We are using this test framework, which is the most popular test new testing framework for R. So from this trace, we generate this file, which basically is something similar to what the developer would write. And also for the values, which will be too big to actually serialize back into a code form, we just store them binary next to the test because it will just be a noise inside the new tests. <coughs> so now the question is, uh, if you put this together, you know, what do we get? So on a simple package uh, here, um, if I run just uh, a code coverage for this particular package, and I'm looking for its test, I see that the, the entire coverage is about 8%. If I, gener uh, if I run our tool, which is called Zender, and I infer tests from examples and vignettes, I'll get to about 80%. And if I also use the, uh, the project dependencies, that I get to 83%. Okay, so this is roughly the idea. But of course, I cherry pick this one, so I know that it's going to work fine and I have nice numbers. So now the question is, can this actually work in practice? Right? Can this scale, first of all? And second, do we actually do something useful for the R ecosystem if we are going to run this? So we designed this uh, experiment. Um, <clears throat> we installed, uh, at the time it was roughly, I don't know, 17% of all the, uh, the, the packages uh, from Crown. That was when we didn't have any infrastructure, so we were running just on the, on the virtual server. So the experiment was quite cool, but still, you know, it was uh, 1,700 packages. And on average, they have a 19% uh, uh, test code coverage. And we extracted all the runnable code, so there were about 360,000 lines that we could run. We run it, and we recorded uh, 5.1 million uh, lines of code, uh, out of which only 1.6 million were the user. So we are looking at just the value which one was before. From there, we managed to uh, generate 1.2 million tests, and as a, eventually we get to some uh, increased code coverage. But this is basically the setup that we did to evaluate if this idea actually makes sense. Yeah. So uh, here are the results uh, slightly better presented. The good thing was that we managed to reproduce 80% of the, uh, the calls. Right? So after uh, running all of these uh, uh, 350,000 uh, lines of code, all of the recorded all the calls and 80% of them are uh, reproducible. So that kind of hints that R is fairly functional and kind of be much um, external state because otherwise we will not be able to, uh, to, to do this. So that was good. And um, here is the, uh, the result in increased test coverage. So the blue one in here is what was the, uh, the code coverage for uh, uh, the R packages that we downloaded. So here always it says, you know, that for example, here we say that, um, I don't know, 25% of the packages have at least 30% of code coverage. And by running our tool, we managed to bring the uh, density. Right? So from average of 19%, we get an average of 50%. So that is a, uh, a nice thing. And that, that was <coughs> the, the kind of concluded the experiment. Now, what was kind of crucial for this was that you know, when we started, we had no infrastructure for doing anything with R, so we had to develop everything ourselves. And actually, uh, based on the uh, this initial tracing thing that we had, that's what we kind of use for all the later experiments. So this was the initial one that we developed. Um, you might ask uh, why actually to play with R, because that's not the uh, the, the language that a lot of people are use, at least in the uh, in the uh, programming uh, language community. Uh, but it's you know first it's a popular language. It's being used uh, out. Uh, People doing uh, data science, they like it. Um, there's some old report which says that at least 2 million users uh, worldwide in the yoga index is quite high. At some point, it was even in top 10. Uh, but <clears throat> it's now feeling that it's uh, falling down a little bit. But there is a great ecosystem. The, uh, there's a lot of packages around, and, the, uh, and there's a lot of code around to, to, to work with. There's 250,000 GitHub repositories, 50,000 packages. And also, from the uh, program analysis uh, perspective, it's a very interesting target because um, you know the R is extremely a dynamic language, which uh, makes it really really hard. Um, the static analysis is really close to impossible unless you do uh, you know, really start using precision quite quickly. It's mostly neglected by the programming language community, which is uh, good. Everyone is analyzing Java or C++, uh, so this one is a nicer target if you want to publish. 
Um, and the um, and also we, we work with uh, real world code, right? It's not synthesized examples that we do, and that makes two challenges. You quickly run into edge cases, right? There is no specification for R. The only specification is the um, R interpreter and virtual machine, and you know that makes really a rabbit hole for engineering because if you would like to run a lot of code, then you really need to spend a lot of time to make your analysis uh, very robust. So that was the first uh, contribution about R. Now let's move to Lascala. It's um, quite nice that it's sort of complete opposite of that one. First, the, the languages are very, very different, targeting completely different people. Most of the R programmers are not computer scientists. You know, they are mathematicians, statisticians, data scientists, whatever you call for that. And you know, they use R interactively mostly. You know, they have the running session, they are looking at the data, they don't really have much ambitions to become, you know, to be programmers. For Scala, on the other hand, that's a real programming language. Well, it's not saying that R is not a real programming language, but that's a programming language that's being used, you know, by people uh who stuff, those are trained uh, software engineers. So it's different. In R we had to do a data analysis. In Scala, we were doing uh, a static analysis. So that was quite a nice contrast. Uh, but first, let me start with a little uh, question to you. So look at this uh, expression. We have a tuple of two numbers. And then on the uh, left hand side and on the right hand side, we have also a tuple of two numbers. And we are trying to compare them. How many call sides do you see there? Well, oh, one, four. It's again four. Choose one. Four. Four. Which ones? The dog business, the dollar, and the divider. Okay, it's almost. It's three. You, know, you make a tuple, you make another tuple, and then you compare them. That's look like. Yeah. But actually, it turned out that this is not the case, and there are 11 calls. <laughs> How can this be? Well, the thing is that if you write this in Scala, actually, the compiler will generate this code before it starts the pipeline. So first, uh, it needs to convert the tuple to something which is called ordering to order. So it converts a tuple to a, a particular type, which defines this uh, comparison operator. And then it actually has to give it a, a, a new tuple, which says how to compare the individual elements. Right? And the first thing is called an implicit conversion. And the second thing is called implicit parameter. That's Scala implicit in 30 seconds. Right. So uh, basically, this part, if you do Haskell or um, other languages which is type classes, Rust, for example, uh, might be a little bit similar, right? So we are basically the, the reason is why this code is nice that you know on the user level you just write this and you don't really worry much about the, the rest, and the language synthesizes it all for you, right? So if I have if I would like to create a new type, which uh, the uh, Scala doesn't know about, and I would like to use uh, in a comparison inside the tuple, I can just say, how do I compare my type? And the language will generate everything else. And it happens in library where you know you need to have it inside the language. But it's quite a lot of code that has to be generated. Right? And this is being used, or when we started this work, was like, you know, how much of, you know, if this simple call is using that much, you know, how if we were look for larger programs, right? You know, what we will see. So the research question here was, you know, how are the Scala implicits used in the body? Right? What did we do? And the idea was that we will collect a real world Scala programs and then we will try to answer a bunch of questions. So these were the ones that we thought were interesting. You know, do, pro uh, do programs use them? Do programs define their own implicits? This one was you know fairly a generic implicit conversion for something that you are comparing elements. So maybe people just use that and they don't define their own. Uh, where do they come from? You know, most of the implicits are they coming just from the standard library, or they are coming from you know some other libraries or projects defined them themselves? What are the patterns that are people using this? Um, and is there any compilation overhead? Because you, know, you see, you know, how massively it expands just as very simple code. So maybe there is some uh, performance um, problems. And you might ask, you know, why to do actually this kind of study? Why is it interesting? And it's interesting from two things, right? First. To see how you know if you introduce this feature in the world, and the thing is that um, the implicits were introduced roughly around the year 2004. And in 2004, people were doing OO. They were trying to solve this problem like if I have a class 
and I would like to have this class uh, implement a particular interface, but after the fact, right? I have defined the class, I cannot change its source code. I have the interface, and now I would like that class to implement that interface. I will, of course, provide the implementation for the interface, but how can I merge it with the original class without changing source code? And, you know, languages try to solve it differently. In Scala, it was through the implicit conversion. But this initial thing was, in the end, not used that much. It was used for many other things. And we are interested exactly in this many other things. You know, if you were looking in the uh, mailing list and other things, you know, there was a lot of kind of uh, anecdotal uh, cases about implicit flowing in the uh, in the ecosystem, and we wanted to put some empirical evidence for you know what is true, what is not, how things are being done in the real world. Um, so for this, we created the following pipelines. Um, we gathered all the projects uh, from GitHub that we could at the time, so this was 2019, there were uh, 65,000 uh, Scala projects with 131 million lines of code, so we downloaded all. Um, but then there was the thing was like, you know, how can we, you know, do we need to analyze all of them? Or, you know, is there any way how we can filter and, and, and find the, uh, the good ones? So first, we, you know, there you have to extract the metadata and, you know, we can get rid of uh, certain projects immediately because our uh, the, we need to be able to compile them, right? If they if you know, <coughs> compile the project, we can analyze it. That was the time. In this case, it was a static analysis. So we don't need to run anything, but we need to compile it. It's a compiled language. So in the end, we managed to get only to 23,000 projects that we could compile. But now we need to look carefully about the duplicates. And that was kind of a fun part of, of, of this project was that um, the biggest project uh, ever written in, uh, in Scala is Apache Spark, which is used also for data science by <laughs> coincidence. And it has a you know 100,000 lines of code. Right? So, uh, and people, what they do on GitHub quite often, or surprisingly often, was that they don't do forks, right? They would just download the source code, you know, untar it, and then put it on GitHub. So basically, you have an identical project, but it's not a fork. So you kind of just remove the forks. You have to somehow do something something bad. And so we <clears throat> spent quite a lot of time to actually manage to get rid of all of the uninteresting projects, right? Because they would really skew the analysis. If you would keep the original one, then 37% of the code base of the corpus that we had would contain Apache Spark, meaning that you know all the data would be really biased towards one particular usage of instances, namely the one that we need. So after we managed to filter our project, we had only 11,000 left, yet we kept most of the GitHub stars. Well, now we know, thanks to Conrad and others, that the GitHub star is not the best indicator for the validity of projects, but at the time, that was what we had. Um, so we were quite happy, and eventually we ended up with uh, 7,200 uh, projects being analyzed from, from some from <coughs> Um, we also shared, so this was quite an, uh, a large corpus, which was also shared with the data center, uh, which is sort of the uh, industrial side of the academic side of the development of, of, of Scala, because they were really in the process of migrating from Scala to Scala 3, so they can use all the information to further drive some of the uh, design decisions that they were up to. This is how the corpus looked like. Uh, we decided to, give, uh, to divide all the projects into three categories, uh, sorry, into four categories, because we thought that each category will probably use the implicit differently. The categories were small applications, less than 1,000 uh, lines of code, uh, large applications, that's larger than uh, 1,000 lines of code, uh, libraries, and um, the test code, right? Because test code usually has a different characteristics than a regular code. This is uh, like you know, how it's gonna look like that the size of the bubble is the size of the uh, is the number of uh, stars, and then we have the uh, the lines of code and uh, number of commits, which kind of give you also a little bit of you know big projects should have <clears throat> a lot of stars hopefully and and should have a lot of commits. So this is what the um, that was our purpose. And now, how do we extract the information about the implicit extraction? So the good, the good thing is that implicits are resolved in a static way, right? There is no dynamic dispatch. So we don't have to run anything, so we can do everything using static analysis. Um, and you know, so let's look at this little code. This is just creating a future of one, which is basically a, uh, a creating a future that can eventually be run to give you a, a constant value of one. This um, Scala will uh, rewrite into this particular code. So this is just a syntactic sugar for the uh, method apply. We have the type inference of the type parameter and then the global is the, the scheduler which will eventually run this thing. 
uh, Scala compiler also gives us this information. So all the things which were uh, which were implicitly added by the compiler, we can sort of get from the compiler after the compilation. Right? So we get this uh, compilation database, which tells us you know, on which line uh, what was added. And what we do with that is that we turn this into our model where we can actually then query via the use of implicitly. So from there we create it, we don't really have to read all of this, but basically uh, we try to extract all the declaration and all the call sites with all the relevant information mainly asking if a declaration is implicit and what are the implicit parameters at the given call sites. And finally, we have like a, a domain specific language written in Scala allowing us to query. So here is the way how we can query all the declarations which are of kind execution context. So we are basically looking for all the places where something like this is being uh, injected by the compiler. And then we can, uh, based on that, we can get all those call sites. And basically, that's how we were, uh, you know, once we managed to get this database of all the uh, or our implicit model, then we were running these queries, and that's where we found that uh, something is being used, not being used, etc. So this is the uh, the results. Uh, so this is the the size of the corpus. We have about 29 million calls in 18 million lines of code, and we figure out that the implicits are really being uh, used everywhere. Um, there's basically no projects without any use of implicit, and almost 80% of projects define their own. So that was surprising. I didn't know that when we started the study. We had certain uh, ideas that it might be uh, like that, but it was surprising. So almost uh, every fourth call site in Scala somehow involved implicit. This is just a picture of the uh, of the corpus. When here, you know, every line uh, shows a project. And this is the, uh, the project's uh, declarations. And here is the, the, the number of the, uh, of the, the, the ratio of implicit calls versus explicit calls. You look at the origins, for example, where they are coming from. So <clears throat> if you look at the tests, uh, you know, the ratio of implicit call sites in tests is really high because all the testing frameworks, they want to provide a nice API. So they do a lot of implicit conversions to give you a sort of a nice uh, method. So there it comes a lot from the external dependency which is the uh, new testing framework. Uh, we look at patterns as well, uh, basically by looking at the existing literature and surveying in the ecosystem, we uh, get a collection of uh, six patterns for each we look how much is being used. The ones which is used, being used the most is the uh, type classes um, and we also classify which type classes are being used and etc. We look also at some anti-patterns, that's the bad uh, examples of, of, of using implicit and classify them as well. Finally, there's this compilation overhead. Um, here, each dot uh, represents a project and uh, it's blue whether it's not using uh, implicit type class derivation or it's red if it does use implicit type class derivation. The type class derivation is basically the, uh, from the first example that we comparison of the two tuples. That was an implicit class derivation when you derive new types based on the existing ones. And it shows like that there is always, you know, the implicit type derivation is the longest kind of a uh, compilation pass in the uh, in the compilation pipeline. So there's going to be always uh, a performance overhead with that. Uh, we see a little bit of the impact of the of the study. This is uh, Martin Oderski. Uh, he's the uh, new designer of the Scala language, and he was uh, using our work to give this presentation about the redesign of implicit for the Scala tree. This is the uh, Lambda World um, <clears throat> presentation in 2019. So it's kind of nice to see that uh, someone cares about it. It was also nice that it was, uh, you know, he showed this uh, before even this work was presented in the, uh, in, in, in Uppsala. But, um, so uh, this concludes the uh, the talk. I hope that you uh, saw at least uh, a little bit how people or people how me and Patricia how it's being done to do this kind of a large scale analysis to answer certain questions about uh, programming language evolution. We showed the example in R and we use dynamic uh, analysis in Scala. We use a static analysis and what kind of questions and things you can do with that. So uh, with that, uh, I'll conclude and the uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, thank you. So, questions? Um, I was wondering for the test extractions, we have some of those. 
to tell which functions are not expected to have a deterministic result. Uh, what do you mean by which functions are not um, expected? So, for example, I don't know, like k means or something, it, it doesn't have the exact result every time, but there is some other way to test if it's correct. So, right. you have some. Uh -huh. kind of so, what, so, for this, what the, the only thing what we do is that we record the, the random seed. Right? So, we always uh, specify you know, the set of seed before, same as we record it. So, hopefully, if there was some non determinism, this will be captured in there. If, it, if the result of the call depends on some other state than just a random number generator, then uh, the test will fail. And that's what we were a little bit uh, worried at the, at the beginning, you know, that maybe, you know, if you would do this in, lang in other languages that are not as functional as R, it would be much harder, right? because you will need much more state to, to gather around. You know, if you have more mutation, let's say you will do it in for Java, you will have to prepare the instance of a class, set all the fields, and then you can run something. Here it was. Uh, uh, easier. What are these branches next to? Uh, oh, right. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is the uh, so in the the conference is where we publish stuff. It's not just that you uh, send there the manuscript, uh, but you also uh, share the code and the experiment. There is a, a program about, uh, there is a committee which evaluates that, so it's an artifact evaluation, it's usually uh, called. And if they find it satisfactory, then they give you uh, badges, meaning that the artifact is first available, meaning you share uh, your code and the data. Um, and then that it's functional, meaning that you, they can uh, reproduce the, uh, the, the things that you claim in the paper, so they will run it and they will see the same numbers. And finally, uh, they have one more, which is, uh, Reproducible? Reproducible? No, there's only functional So it's functional, reproducible, and available, I think. Okay. Well, there's one more which basically tells you that uh, you know it can probably work with other input than the one that you just provided, right? So you know, for our case, it's kind of easy because you know we do 1,500 packages, <coughs> and we select another 1,500 packages, and hopefully the pipeline will still work. That's roughly what it says. Uh, but that's maybe for you might be interesting, like uh, in at least in, in this particular field of programming languages slash software engineering, let's say, uh, you know, like one paper is basically a year worth of work. You know, maybe I'm slow, <laughs> it could be also the case. But it's just, you know, it's it's tricky. You have to develop first the code, which can crunch all the data, which can scale to, uh, to, to for, you know, all the programs that you want to analyze. And then the looking into data and try to derive some insights of them just takes a lot of time. So it's not just Writing the paper eventually, it's just you know the last three weeks before the deadline. So, but to getting there, it's it's it's, it's really painful. And the uh, the artifact evaluation process has a lot of things that they could improve. But at least now we have something like that. You know, so you don't just send a paper with a bunch of data, right? Uh, but at least there is some kind of evidence that you can sort of uh, you know there is an environment in which you can rerun it and you should hopefully get to uh, the same conclusion. Might be still wrong, right? <laughs> if there is some methodological mistake, but at least you have something. So that's that is quite nice. Yeah, further question. If not, then let's thank again.